Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the organisers for having us here today. Um, it's been a fascinating session, albeit very short, because I'm aware of how short 10 minutes is to present. Um, what I've found very interesting so far is how much I've agreed with all the previous presenters, including those uh, presenting from the other side of the debate. Um, I've been head of animal welfare and captivity at Born Free for a while now. I've been at Born Free for 15 years. Um, you know, these issues keep getting debated, but I'm quite gratified to see uh, what appears to be the current strength of uh, feeling on the motion. Anyway, let's see if I can improve things uh, in that regard. It's been touched on already, exotic. What do we mean by exotic animals? I'm not going into big definitions of things, but um, something I would, uh, I would stick to is the, the definition of a wild animal in the Zoo Licensing Act, which is a, an animal of a species not normally um, <coughs> domesticated in Great Britain. Um, I know within veterinary circles, exotic might include ferret, rabbit, guinea pig, goldfish. I'm not talking about them for the purposes of this, this discussion. Um, and where do these exotic animals reside in the UK? Um, again, they might reside in any of these places, so circuses, mobile animal exhibits, performances, rescues and sanctuaries. I'm going to limit my discussion here, as, as Romain and Tarek have done, actually, to zoos and within the pet trade, both on sale and also at the, uh, in, the, in the homes of uh, pet owners. Um, but first, I also just want to talk about welfare. Um, can we meet the, need, the welfare needs of exotic animals in captivity? That needs dissection a bit. I think we need to think about what we mean by meeting the welfare needs of animals. Um, a useful lens, in my opinion, to look at welfare of animals is, is the five domains. I'm sure it's, it's gaining increasing currency, so many of you will be familiar with it. For those that aren't, what it does is encapsulate both the positive aspects of welfare and the negative aspects of welfare that need to be considered both in terms of what happens to an animal, which would be uh, categories one, two, three, and four, and then how that animal experiences uh, those, those activities, those, those uh, um, experiences themselves. And at each step, there are, there are things to consider that affect animals negatively, and of course, you know, ensuring that the consideration is given to animals having a positive experience. And all too often, I would venture that we are stuck in a bit of a habit and, uh, of, of looking at traditional welfare indicators of does the animal have food and water, does it have any disease, does it have any injuries? If everything on those three criteria is okay, then the animal's welfare is fine. I think for us to be talking about adequately meeting the needs of, of animals, we need to be talking about providing pos opportunities for positive welfare. So I'd like you to have that in mind as we talk about in, in, the, in the various discussions moving forward about whether we're able to meet the needs of exotic animals. Um, so just to look at the scale of the issue. Uh, when I say exotics, we're not just talking about the old bearded dragon. Um, across the pet and zoo industries, just by way of an example, within Biaza zoos, so that's zoos that are members of the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquariums, there are more than 380 mammal species, 700 bird species, 260 reptile species, 80 amphibian species. Um, and in fact, British zoos may keep somewhere in the region of 7.6% uh, of all mammal species in existence. That's a vast range of species. Looking at zoos within the UK that are both within and without Biaza, not the, the figure I just showed you for the number of species in Biaza zoos, there are 57 mammal species not kept, kept in zoos that are not in Biaza zoos. So you can see that the range that we're talking about is, is again increasing each time you look at it, depending on how you cut the cake in effect. Um, so that's just the range of species and within those species of course we're talking about a huge range of welfare needs. We're looking at everything from, you know, within even primates, you're looking at pygmy marmosets through to gorillas in terms of their enclosure sizes, in terms of their diet, in terms of their environmental needs. There's an enormous variation. And of course, it's not just at the species level. Um, so in Great Britain, as Mark, I think, said, there's, there's quite a few more than 300 licensed zoos currently. And a single zoo, as any one of those 300, might keep up to, or even more than, 4,000 individual mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians from 
310 species. And that's, that's I, I plucked an example that I knew to be a big zoo, and that is, that's the figures there. So within that one facility, there's an enormous range, not just of species, but also in terms of number of animals whose welfare needs need to be met. The problem comes when we think about this range of species and this number of individuals is that there is a basic, a lack of basic biological information and field data for many species in zoos. And I would strongly argue that in order to meet the welfare needs of animals, you need to understand them. You need to know what they should have in order to know how to provide for it. And I think it's becoming increasingly acknowledged that that isn't the case for a huge range of species that we have in human care. And what's in some ways worse is that within the zoo sector, we have a, 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 currently a, a, a tradition, no, not tradition, a, a system whereby species-specific standards, or in some cases just general standards of animal keeping, are based on tradition or current practice or hearsay or what Bob down the road does in his zoo, and rather than on any sort of evidence base or scientific validation. And even in those species that are relatively well studied, and I, I would extend that definition to elephants, um, we know the needs of these animals. We know their social requirements. We know their space requirements. We know quite a bit about dietary requirements. And yet it is still considered perfectly acceptable within the current licensing system that Remain has alluded to, to keep out these complex and sensitive animals in a circumstance like this. This is not really a snapshot of that enclosure. That's pretty much the whole enclosure for those two elephants at Belfast Zoo. Um, there's indications of enrichment. I can tell you that they're, they're not in use. So even in those, those species that we know about, and, and we know a little bit about, quite a lot about, we're still not able to meet their needs in captivity, I would say, for the most part. So within zoos, how are zoos performing? I've got some data going back to 2005, 2008. And about 9% of individual criteria assessed across a pooled sample of zoos were relating to animal welfare were assessed by zoo inspectors themselves as to either not meet the standard or require a, a condition in order to meet the standard. And actually, only, well, less than a quarter of zoos were fully meeting all the standards to do with animal welfare in that study. And I thought it was quite interesting that membership of the zoo, you know, National Zoo Association, Association Bianza was not associated with higher overall assessment of animal welfare standards. So animals in zoos are hugely varied and perhaps we're failing to deliver reasonable welfare, let alone good welfare. So I'm going to shift very quickly on to pets, given that the red light is on already at the back. Mark's already covered the issues relating to dangerous wild animals. We use these figures not because there's anything specifically inherent with dangerous wild animals' welfare needs, but the fact that they are an indication of the scale of what we're dealing with in terms of delivering good welfare. Um, you've got 240 primates under DWA license in the UK. More than 600 venomous reptiles. Um, and with any exotic animal in the pet trade and in private hands, not only, again, enormous range of species, but a wide range of sources of information of how to look after these animals. I found it absolutely fascinating to read in the booklet that uh, we've been given for this that the Animal Welfare Foundation is reporting that a quarter of pet owners do no research before buying a pet. I mean, that says something about people's attitudes to, to pet ownership. But what about the 75% of people who do try and do some research around their pet? So let's say you have a red-eared terrapin, and you Google, as I did, uh, terrapin water temperature. And I have to say, I, know, I have no idea what the correct answer on this is, but the first four answers I got on recommendations for water temperature were as, as follows. It might be that all of these temperatures are fine, but these are, these are appearing on the internet as uh, sound advice for reptile keepers. As, as ranges for how you, you know, for what water temperature you provide your, your terrapin. And of course, that's, that's expanded across diet and enclosure size and you name it. So who do people turn to? Well, they might turn to the vets. And at the risk in a vet, mostly veterinary audience of offending people, I think it's fair to say that given the range of species we're dealing with here, veterinary knowledge may not be comprehensive. 
Um, that's perhaps an understatement. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, but I would be surprised if those vets in general practice see more than five species in an, on an average week or, or less. Uh, obviously, there are some zoo vets who will see many, many more, but the general understanding of uh, treatment and veterinary care to offer to a wide range, an increasing range of exotic pets is perhaps not in place. Um, and similarly, what isn't also in place is what we might have, or we do have, for domesticated species. Admittedly, they're overstretched and overwhelmed, but dogs and cats and similar species, there is a long-standing network of shelters and rehoming organisations to which people can turn in, an, in a crisis, in an emergency, and that can do some, work, some part in, in sweeping up the problem of animals that are cast off from, from uh, pet ownership. The same is not true for exotic animals, and hence we see situations where animals are dumped uh, quite frequently, and the RSPCA figures that Mark alluded to a minute ago speak volumes to that. Um, perhaps an exception that proves the rule. Um, the photo on the right I took at a fair recently, and this was a reptile rescue um, that was uh, obviously at, a, at a, a country fair advertising their good work. But I think it speaks volume, and I didn't know what Tarek was going to put in his presentation, but this is how this reptile rescue keeps their reptiles in these, uh, what do you call them, tray systems without substrate and clearly no, no adequate room for, for moving. So we've got a problem there. So I would say, in conclusion, we've got a huge variation in exotic animals in, in terms of the species. It's incomprehensible how many species we might be dealing with within both zoos and pets in their enormous variation in, in welfare requirements, in people's knowledge and understanding of these animals, and in the availability uh, of resources that are on offer for these animals. And I would say in general, it simply is not possible to guarantee good welfare for wild animals in captivity. And I'll leave it there, thank you. <laughs>